Hello, Lavington Vineyard Church. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. And whoever you are, if you just heard about this video from a friend, maybe got sent the link, or somehow you just happened to stumble upon it. My name is Jeremy, and I serve as one of the pastors of this great church. Several years ago, I experienced a situation where I experienced a lot of anxiety in one moment. So I was in this uh, friendship where there had, had risen some conflict, some tension. We'd had some back and forth, some good one-on-one, -on -one, direct, honest conversations. But there was definitely some disagreement there, some tension. So on this one particular episode, I had sent an email sharing some of my concerns and my honest thoughts. I thought graciously, but I got back an email, a very brief email that sent me into this grip of anxiety where I was actually paralyzed with anxiety. I don't know if it was a real panic attack, but this was something that just kind of came from out of nowhere to where for a good half hour, I was on the floor in front of my fireplace in basically a fetal position. And I don't know exactly what happened to this day. What happened to me and why, I don't know exactly. But I was there just paralyzed by this anxiety. So that led to me getting some counseling where I worked with a, a Christian counselor to walk through this, to talk through this, to see what was going on in my heart and in my mind to where I was on the floor essentially prostrate for a half an hour, unable to move. Well, I think as believers, as followers of Jesus, too often we can be gripped by fear and anxiety, and we know where it can lead. It harms our relationship with God. It can harm our relationship with other people, and it can harm our ability to move forward in life. We could just feel stuck, like we're in quicksand, one step forward, two steps back. So we all have these fears and anxieties. Maybe for you, you've, you've never found yourself in a fetal position because of fear or anxiety. But we all have them. And the question is, will we acknowledge them? Maybe you have been paralyzed by fear and anxiety. Maybe even right now, there's a situation in your life that is paralyzing you with fear and anxiety. And the question that comes to all of us is, will we acknowledge them? And then what will we do with them. Well, in our final sermon in the series on prayer, on corporate prayer, I chose this passage from 2 Chronicles chapter 20 because there's this amazing corporate prayer where this king in this Old Testament story calls the people to prayer and fasting. So if you remember last week, I preached a sermon on fasting in the beginning of this month, calling us as a church in this uncertain year full of a lot of anxiety because of the uncertainty at least calling us to prayer and fasting. Well, in this Old Testament story, we have the story of King Jehoshaphat, who we, we get these insights about what it looks like when we confront our fear, how God loves to work on our behalf when we confront our fears. And so what I want us to do is just enter into this story. If you're a disciplined note taker, uh, I'm not going to have as many clear points for you. I'm going to try to pull out some, some key insights. But what I want us to do with a text like this is just enter into it as best we can and to feel the force of it. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we have these armies coming against Judah. Three armies who are not just coming against them, but they are on their doorstep. So these messengers come and they tell the king. And it says in verse 3, King Jehoshaphat is afraid. He's afraid and he sets his face to seek help from the Lord and then he proclaims a fast throughout all of Judah. Well, in response, the people assemble. They come corporately together and Jehoshaphat stands before them and prays. So this is his prayer from verse 6 of chapter 20. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel 
and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? I love that. He calls him his friend. Abraham was God's friend. Verse 8, And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What a prayer. So the king, King Jehoshaphat, acknowledges God as the sovereign ruler, the king over all nations who has power and might. Then he recalls that God drove out the people before them to give them this land with a condition that they would cry out to God if affliction comes. Well, the affliction is now here and it's an injustice. And so in the face of this injustice, he calls on God to bring justice. And he admits powerlessness. Did you notice that? He admits powerlessness. What ancient king especially does that? Of course, what leader today does that? But admits powerlessness and says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Well, then after the prayer, the inspired author, the narrator, gives us this meanwhile. A meanwhile there in verse 13 that is pregnant with meaning. And notice how the author highlights little ones. So you have, it says, all of Judah, and these are, it's referring to the fighting men who would be called up to be in the army, are there. But the author says, not just with their wives and children, but it says little ones and wives and and children, highlighting the fact of the vulnerability, the absolute fragility of this situation. They are surrounded by enemy armies and they are powerless. So one of the things we learn from this story is that acknowledging fear creates healthy dependence. Did you see that? Acknowledging fear creates healthy dependence. It says the king was afraid. Now, King Jehoshaphat never says this himself, but I think we see it demonstrated in the nature of his prayer. And then the inspired author of scripture says, verse 3, King Jehoshaphat was afraid. The Christian psychologist and author Ed Welch talks about the fact that we often want to suppress our fear and run away from it or ignore it, pretend like it's not there. But he says that we should not minimize our fears. That actually, there comes, there's a power in acknowledging our fears. And I think there's a power in acknowledging any and every emotion that would be, we would bottle up and that it would just come out in unhealthy ways. So there was a time when, as a family, we were doing family counseling. Maybe you're wondering, what is up with this Cook family and all the counseling? Hey, we are not ashamed of it. We're not afraid of it. It has been a means of grace to us. But we were seeing this family counselor and she said something so simple but so profound because of our human tendency to just suppress fear or anxiety or anger. And she said, look, there will be times when you just need to say, I feel angry. I'm angry. And I wonder if that would be a challenge for you. In whatever situation, whether at work or in your family, with neighbors, whatever, Or maybe you think, you know, that would just feel so inauthentic to just express that with words. Of course I'm angry. I feel it. I show it. But are you showing it in a way that is hurting perhaps people you love the most? And so there is this power in acknowledging, I am scared. I am afraid. I am anxious or I am angry. So acknowledging powerlessness opens doors for God. That's another thing we see in this story, in this early part. Acknowledging powerlessness opens the door for God. And it's this God as Father who wants to draw near to us in the midst of our fear and anxiety. So again, Ed Welch, 
He says that we are needy by design. Will you give up the myth of independence, the myth of self-sufficiency, of autonomy? So many people in this world are addicted to their own independence and they think, I got this, but they don't got this. Acknowledging powerlessness opens the door for God. So dependence is expressed beautifully in this prayer that in our English translations give us this rhyme. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now look, in my American culture, in Christian bookstores, so-called, you would easily have this as a cliche. When you walk in, there on a shelf is a coffee mug with a, you know, an, a sweet little angel and the words, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. But look, it doesn't have to be a cliche. Don't let it be a cliche for you. It is rich truth from the word. And so what it says is we acknowledge our powerlessness and we look on him. We trust in him. It's saying, God, that no matter what I see with the physical eye, no matter what is right in front of me, I am looking to a bigger, a deeper reality, a truer reality. I'm looking to you. Well, so then we we have this shift from acknowledging fear. What does it mean to shift from acknowledging our fear to focusing on God and not on our problems? And you may wonder, well, what does this look like? What does this look like to then take action for the, the issues in my life? So as we get to that point in the text and as we unfold it and get into it and try to learn from it, let me just ask you to take a minute or we're just for 60 seconds, we're going to put up this question on the screen. And I don't want you to go and refill your tea or coffee or go to the washroom. If you need to pause it, go for it. But take the 60 seconds with other people viewing and to sit there and reflect. Maybe share with a neighbor who's there next to you. But to sit and ask this question, what are your fears or anxieties right now? All right, so then let's dive back into the text. In verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon the Levitical priest Jehaziel, who utters this prophetic word. So from verse 15, the priest says this to Jehoshaphat and all of those assembled. Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. The Lord will be with you. Do not be afraid for the battle is the Lord's. You won't need to fight. Do you notice that? Stand firm. Imagine just being one of those men who would be called up into the army and you're being told by this priest, even though you know that the armies are out there, three armies, And he's saying, stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord. There's this great um, DC Comics movie by the the brilliant director, director Christopher Nolan. And I love these movies of his where in the beginning, Batman begins. 
there's this amazing scene where Bruce Wayne, who's not yet Batman, after having a childhood trauma with bats, he decides he goes into this cave and he stands there firmly and he even holds out his hands as thousands of bats whirl around him and he confronts his fear. Well, here, these people are surrounded not by thousands of bats, but by thousands of bloodthirsty men who want to slaughter them, including their little ones. And the prophet, the priest says, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Go out against them. And imagine being one of those men holding your little toddler in your arms. And you're thinking, how? How do we go out against them? The priest says, the Lord will be with you. Well, then we see that they all bow before the Lord and they worship him. And the priest prays the Lord with a loud voice. Now, the result is absolutely astounding. They rise early and they go out into the wilderness. They go out to face these three armies. And Jehoshaphat calls them to what? To believe. This king pointing forward to the king of kings who would come and tell people in fear, do not fear, only believe. Well, here in this ancient text, what happens is the worship band goes out. They're on the front lines, the worship team, basically. And they begin to sing a song of thanks, acknowledging the steadfast love of the Lord. And then when they begin to sing and praise, the Lord sets an ambush so that the enemies are routed by destroying one another. So, church, when I was thinking of this and I was preparing and I I said, okay, this is the result. We see in verses 20 to 23, the result and I was, I was wondering, how do I teach this in such a way? Because there could be a danger, church, that if we take a story, whether old or New Testament story, narrative scripture, we need to be careful. And I just want to say this quick word to you as one of your pastors and a Bible teacher. We need to be careful not to take these stories and then think that they're a formula or a blueprint to just put onto our lives. So if you're going to go into a job interview, Maybe you've studied this passage. You you don't take from this passage that you go into that job interview and you start singing, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. It's probably not going to go over well. You're probably not going to get the job. You don't, or you don't go into a, a difficult conversation with a friend where there's tension and conflict and start singing, this is how I fight my battles. It's probably not going to go over very well. And yet, what we can learn from this story, the the principles of this story, is that worship, as they begin to worship and put their eyes on Him and acknowledge Him, He came through for them. And so as you see these experiences in your life, as you face these challenges, let me encourage you. One of of our elders, Stephen, you know, as we spend this month in prayer, he said, you know, we got to teach people how to use musical worship as part of our prayer life. And that is so true, that as you face things, sometimes you don't even know what to pray. And so you just put on worship music, whatever it is, and you just say, Lord, this is the way I'm crying out to you, is through this music. So one of the other things that we learn from the story, especially in the second part, is that focusing on God and not the problem creates possibilities. What do I mean by possibilities? Well, do you notice that The prophecy doesn't specify how they'll be saved. He just ends with, the Lord will be with you. So then they're called to take action. Even though they don't know how the Lord is going to come through, they're just called to step out into that wilderness. And the worship team leads them. And they say, Lord, we don't know what's going to happen, but we are trusting you. Because the prophet, their priest said, the Lord is with you. Look, when a child has a nightmare and they wake up, Maybe, maybe shivering or shuddering in fear. What do they do? They don't just think rationally, oh, well, I was asleep and I had a nightmare. Now let me go back to sleep. No, they go to their parents' room because they want to be in their presence to tell them about the nightmare and to hear words of reassurance. 
Parents, maybe even for you, if you experience this with your child, may use that, those precious moments with your child to think about the fact that that's what God wants for you. That as you face your fears and anxieties, maybe it feels like a nightmare. He's saying, come into my presence so that I can tell you who I am and that I love you. And then you tell him about these fears and anxieties and he says, I'm with you. And he holds you. Look, is the antidote to fear or anxiety really just the resolution of your problems? Are you open to the idea that your heavenly Father has so much more for you than just the mere resolution of your problems? Problems that I imagine must seem so huge. But He's with you and He wants you to know that. Did you know that the most frequent command in the entire Bible is do not be afraid? It's not do not do this or that bad thing. It's do not be afraid. And in most of those times, it's do not be afraid for or because I am with you or because I will fight for you. It's not do not be afraid because that's bad. It's do not be afraid for I am with you. The Lord is with us. Listen to this testimony from our sister Eunice. So LVC, I'm excited to welcome Eunice, who's one of our worship leaders, and she's going to share a testimony. But just a quick note, LVC, the worship leaders have been working hard to, you know, when they can't lead worship at McKinney Hall in front of us, working hard to put together a playlist so that, that goes along with the sermon. So let me encourage you to go use that either right after the sermon or later in the week when you're cooking or working, because I think it'll bless you. They work hard to take the themes of the sermon to match songs with that. So we trust that it will bless you. Well, Eunice, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks so much for, for sharing today. And I understand that you faced a job transition at one point in your life that caused some fear and anxiety. So tell us about that. Yes. Um, so a few years ago, I, I attended a leadership conference. And, um, and after that, I just started, you know, sort of feeling like uh, God was pushing me in a different uh, direction and to sort of make a, a change um, in terms of my career. And, um, you know, I started praying about it um, and, and just asking for direction. Um, I think maybe I thought it would happen immediately, but it took some time. Um, and about a year later, um, in fact, the way it happened was, was just extraordinary because I was, I was, you know, I just happened on a specific day to think about um, a, an organization that I had been, you know, every once in a while sort of checking to see if they had anything. I hadn't checked anything in months. And so I checked that day and I saw that there was a role that looked perfect and it was due that same day within a few hours. <laughs> so I wow. basically had only a few hours to put together an application. There were many essays. I had to write all of them and just sort of, you know, submitted it, I think, at, at like, you know, one minute to the time it was due um, mm -hmm. and just sort of let it go. And then, you know, a, a, a week or so later, I heard back from them. I went through a very grueling uh, interview process. And um, finally, I got the call and they said that um, that uh, they made an offer and, and, and I found out that I had, um, I got the job. So God. initially, you know, this would have been very exciting and it, it was, but then um, there was a huge caveat. So um, one, I was, it, it was going to be a fixed term um, contract for 18 months. So I would be essentially moving from a permanent role to an 18, to have a role which, um, which was um, for only 18 months. And then mm -hmm. the biggest issue was that I was basically going to have to take um, a significant pay cut. And this is what caused, I think, a lot of the, the stress and anxiety and fear. At the time, I was a single mom um, with two kids. Um, this was before I married Kaima. But, you know, it was, it was just a tough time because I was, I, I, you know, the worst thing I think, like, for me at that time would have been to, to sort of try and think about having, having to deal with a reduced budget when I was already, you know, struggling to take care of the kids. I was getting some education support at that time, but again, I didn't know when that would end. So, so I was really stressed <laughs> about yeah. this and just trying to figure out what to do at that point. Okay. And how did, how did your home group and the church in general help you? Yeah. Um, so um, I was attending um, home group with the Kintus um, and 
we had actually that entire year, I think we had really been praying about this. And it was, you know, sort of one of those recurrent prayer items that we were constantly just praying about mm -hmm. for God to give me direction and guidance. And so when this happened, of course, I came to the group and shared and, um, and I think what was just really important is that we, you know, the, 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 the response from the group was let's pray, let's pray about this. Mm -hmm. And we prayed. Um, and they were just, you know, really encouraged me that God was going to show me and, and that, you know, he wouldn't bring this um, unless he had a plan. And, and, and that was really encouraging, um, you know, as I was sort of just really trying to grapple with what this would mean if I, if I took this job um, and just the uncertainty um, that would come with it. And then um, actually the decision, I, I made the decision um, after uh, that Sunday, I went to LVC and um, during the worship, um, the worship team led us in singing the song Oceans. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, I, I don't think I had, I had, I had, you know, sung that song in a, in, in, a, in a while. And there's just, it was almost like the way, you know, like Moses hearing God, um, you know, hearing a voice from, you know, from, from above. It, it was just very clearly, I just heard God speaking to me um, through the words of that song. And, and I remember we sang it not just once, but twice. And it was like, God was trying to emphasize and make sure that I heard. And, you know, just the words of the, of the, the song, um, you call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. I will call upon your name, keep my eyes above the waves. My soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine. And I just felt that God was telling me, yes, it's very unclear. It's very uncertain. You're seeing these ways, but you just need to, you just need to walk out. Um, I'm with you and I'm going to carry you through this. Amen. Well, praise God for how he met you in that, in that worship time. So then tell us what, what happened. Yeah. So, um, so after that, I, I, you know, I, I took the job and um, looking back, it's, it's so clear how God went before me, um, how he just opened doors. I mean, Within six months after taking the job, I, I was in um, a permanent role, no longer fixed term contract. Mm. Um, and, you know, the fears that I had actually came to fruition. Um, you know, the, the education support that I was getting ended very shortly after I got the job. But mm. then I think that happened so God could show me that I just needed to rely on him. And he just provided in ways that I could not fathom and, you know, that I can't even explain. Um, and, and, and within 18 months, um, I actually was in my boss's role. And, um, you know, it, with, uh, God opened a door basically that would have seemed impossible at that time for, uh, you know, um, for me as a Kenyan to be in a role where uh, no Kenyan had ever, ever been, you know, mm, been in, in, in a similar role in, in a similar grade before. So it was, it's just God, his faithfulness is just so amazing. And I, and I think throughout the whole thing, I could, I can just see how, you know, according to the words of the song, he took me deeper than my feet could ever wander. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was more than I could even have anticipated or could could imagine. Um, and my faith was really made stronger, just like the words in, in, in the song, um, you know, through that entire experience. So I'm grateful to God. Amen. That's beautiful. Thank you, Eunice. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Love to the family. All right. Thanks. We'll do. So church, we've seen the power of acknowledging our fears and anxieties and then pivoting our focus, pivoting from a focus on our problems to a focus on God and the fact that he is with us. And so personally for you, in my life, this is what it's looked like for me. So for you, you need to go before the Lord and say, God, you got to help me with this. Now for me, and I would encourage this for anyone, but what I did in that situation, in addition to counseling, I took the better part of a year and I looked up every single verse in the Bible on fear and anxiety. And I spent that year often with a verse a day, just sitting in that one verse and meditating on it, just marinating in it, praying it before the Lord to transform my heart and my mind, to reorient my focus, my perspective. And I can't tell you, brothers and sisters, how much the Lord used that in my life. So maybe you need to do that as well. And I'm happy to share that list of verses with you. Come to the prayer seminar on the, the 30th, Saturday the 30th of January, next Saturday. We invite you to come. Yes, it's four hours on a Saturday morning, but even if you have Zoom fatigue, let me encourage you, push past that Zoom fatigue to come and learn about prayer, not just by hearing, but by doing. We're gonna learn about prayer by experiencing prayer. And maybe for you, you're at a place where fears and anxieties are crippling you. They are paralyzing you. 
but come just not to learn, not just to learn about prayer, but to meet with the Lord with us on that day. Or maybe you want to pray with the prayer team. If, if this is after the fact, if you're watching this after Sunday morning from 11 to 11.30, come the next Sunday. Our prayer team would always love to pray with you from 11 to 11.30 in the Zoom prayer room. You can find the links there uh, in the YouTube, on Facebook, wherever we communicate. But also counseling. Look, we are a fan of good, solid counseling in this church. And so if you need help with that, or just a referral, or if you would struggle to pay for it, we want to see how, as much as possible, we could help you get that counseling to address crippling fears and anxieties that you may have. Well, beyond the personal, corporately, as a church family, as a body. Look, we're coming into this year as leaders saying, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So regathering. We don't know what it's going to look like. We'd like to target Easter Sunday even just as a one-off to finally come back together after a year's time. But given everything happening on the ground, we are church saying, Lord, we don't know what to do. We have some ideas, but our eyes are fully on you. And in our 2021 Emphasis Church, we are saying we want to strengthen a family on mission as we learn to thrive during this pandemic and beyond. So will you be part of strengthening this church family in whatever way you can? so that we can do that, we can thrive beyond our fears and anxieties, not just survive. And then church, let's be reminding each other of the gospel. Let's be proclaiming the gospel to each other. Gospel conversations where we are reminding each other in various ways, home groups, one-on-one, prayer groups, that the greatest enemy has already been defeated. The Bible says that death is the last enemy to be defeated. Our greatest problem has been solved. And that's why we have a hope beyond this life that's full of toil. And the fact that the Lord is with us, confronting our fears and anxieties, means that we have the power to engage in this world and to not be crippled by those things in our lives. So will you go beyond the myth of independence and seek help? We need each other, church. Let's be that for each other. Let's pray. God, we are people who in our nature, we want to stand firm on our own. And Lord, I pray that for those who it is so hard to admit that they are needy, Lord, would you stir their hearts by your Holy Spirit to realize how much we need each other. And the ability to say, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Lord, may that not be a cliche, but may it be profound truth that would transform our lives as we trust you and then step out and take action and trust you for the results. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. We'll see you later. Thank you.